All right, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Structure Free Learning. And in this video, I hope to provide you with an overview of the force method of analysis and just give you a sense of what it is and how we do it. And more importantly, why we do it, really. And the force method, in case you are wondering, not everyone calls it the force method. It is known by many names. It is also called the flexibility method, the compatibility method, the method of consistent deformations, the method of superposition. Shoot, if it was a rapper, it would be known as method man. <laughs> In any case, it doesn't even matter what the name of the method is. The whole point is to try to determine the support reactions for a statically indeterminate structure. And once you have the support reactions, then you can draw the internal loading diagrams or the normal shear and moment diagrams of your structure. And then you can say you've analyzed the structure because once you have completed these two goals of any structure, you can calculate stresses, you can determine how the structure or where the structure is going to fail. And then you can even design your structure, which is really, you know, the most important thing that you can design something. All right. So what is the force method? I mean, we know why we want to use it. It's, we're going to be given a statically indeterminate structure. And in a nutshell, and in a nutshell, the force method, what it does is you take an indeterminate structure and you break it up into some set of statically determinate and stable structures. Then you combine them or relate them together using the compatibility equations. And then once you've got those, shoot, you just solve for the other reactions. Now, if you're comfortable with this introduction, then you're probably good right now. You know what I'm saying? The force method is just a way for us to take an indeterminate structure and break it up into manageable statically determinate parts and and then combine them through compatibility equations. And once we have the compatibility equations with our equilibrium equations, we have enough equations to solve for all the unknowns, which are the support reactions, AO. And really, just like any other method for solving statically indeterminate structures, we just need to satisfy compatibility and equilibrium. And if our method to solve our statically indeterminate structures can satisfy compatibility and equilibrium, then we're good. Dude, it's just like marriage, compatibility and equilibrium. You know what I'm saying? Or the force. So you can stop here and go on to an example problem if you feel comfortable. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail about all the different parts in the rest of the video. All right, so if you're still with me now, we're gonna go through a detailed introductory example. And as I do this example problem, I'm gonna try to give you an overview of the approach, some of the maybe more details and explanations of the, the process that the force method involved. Do the calculations simultaneously. That way you can see how it's applied right away. So let's say we're given a structure that has a constant flexural rigidity. This is this EI, it's constant for the entire length of the beam and I, I won't draw it yet but it's going to be statically indeterminate and what we want to do is find the support reactions and draw the shear and moment diagrams there won't be any axial loading so there won't be an in, any internal axial load diagram that's associated with it and, and the first thing that we're going to want to do as with any structures problem is evaluate the determinacy and what we have here is a beam with a fixed support here at end A on the left and a roller support at B. You know, we don't have any closed loops. We don't have any hinges. So really, this is a structure where we can count the number of reactions. Here I have three. And at the roller, I have one. To evaluate its determinacy, I would just say I have my number of unknowns in this case are four. And the only equations that I know of right now are the equilibrium equations. And so I have three of these. And so this would be one degree of indeterminacy. Now, the idea of redundant reactions is important here. And what the heck is a redundant reaction? And a redundant reaction is really a reaction that is more than you really need for a statically determined determinate structure. And so in this case, I have, I essentially have one redundant reaction. And in general, the number of degrees of indeterminacy is the same as the number of redundant reactions. So in this case here, I also have one redundant reaction. Now, which one of the one of the reactions that are shown in my drawing are redundant? 
Well, the redundant reactions are any ones where if you removed it, the structure would be stable and determinate. So by, we could choose it to be the redundant reaction because then I would just have a cantilevered beam that would have you know a fixed support at A. I could remove the moment. Then I would just have a simply supported beam. I can't remove AX here because if I remove AX, then essentially what I have is a skateboard, right? Then my, my structure could slide left to right. It's not one I can choose as a redundant reaction. All right, so I evaluated the determinacy. I have a statically indeterminate structure where the number of unknowns is greater than the number of equations. Yes. All right. Great. And, and the, what that really tells me is how many more equations do I need to solve it? And in the force method, these extra equations are the compatibility equations. So this is where I start. And then now I'm going to be choosing to use the force method. And in the force method, the first thing that we got to do is basically break up my statically indeterminate structure into stable determinant structures with various loads on it. And I'll be using the principle of superposition here. And this part's important because essentially what we're doing is taking this statically indeterminate structure and breaking it up into manageable problems that are statically determinate for us. In order to break it up, first I have to create a stable and determinate structure. I'm going to choose my redundant reaction to be BY in this case, and I'm gonna remove BY when I make these drawings. So I choose BY as a redundant, and so I'm gonna remove it and redraw this structure. And you'll notice in general, the number of drawings I need to make is one more than the number of redundant reactions or number of degrees of indeterminacy. So I had one degree of indeterminacy, so I broke up my structure into two statically determinate drawings, all right? And the thing that's different, even though the structural system and geometry, let's say the cantilever beam in this case, are the same between my broken up drawings, what's different are the loads. And so this first drawing here, this drawing right here, would represent the primary loading that's on the structure structure, basically the external loads that are applied to the structure itself. And sometimes I like to call it the zero drawing. And then, and this would be, look at, check it out. This is a statically determinate beam, a cantilever beam with a fixed support at the left, a uniformly distributed load of two kilonewtons per meter. You can solve for the support reactions. You can calculate displacements. Life is good. The next drawing right here is what we'll call the redundant drawing or redundant loading. And the reason it's called the redundant loading is because the redundant reaction that we chose is reintroduced to the statically determinate structure as if it were an external load. So here, even though I'm going to use the symbol BY, I'm reintroducing the reaction. Notice the direction that I had originally was upwards for BY, and so I'm going to keep that same direction, BY, but in this case, this BY now is a load, all right? And so I have a cantilever beam that's five meters long with a B with a load BY, some unknown number applying upwards. And so, shoot, that's what I have, and these are my drawings. And if you can make this drawing, you're halfway there. So now the next thing I need to do is write out what are called my compatibility equations. And writing the compatibility equations is essentially relating the deformation or the display shape of the structures together. It basically helps us relate one thing to another. Another way to put it is that it accounts for consistent deformations between the drawings and the actual structure. But more importantly, it provides the other equations that you need to solve the problem. The compatibility equation is always related to the displacement associated with the redundant reaction that you chose. So for instance, we chose BY, right? And so that means it's information about the deformation at point B of our beam. And if I give my beam a coordinate system here, so I'll just say this I'll, call, I'll give it the symbol V for a vertical or for vertical de deformations or de displacement. The equation of the elastic curve is another way to put it. This is a coordinate system. The origin is at A here. And basically what we're saying here is that if I look at the actual structure itself, the displacement of that structure 
when x equals 5 meters is equal to 0. Yes, that should be equal to 0. But then I look at my, my structures that I broke it up into right here. Here, this cantilever beam, based on this loading here, I know that it's going to look something like this right here. There's going to be some deformation right there. And then if I have a cantilever beam with a concentrated force here pointing up, I suspect the deformation will be like this. Yes, and this would be that deformation there. And if I give each of these individual problems, essentially, its own coordinate system, so here's this x, the origin here, and I'll call this v0 for the primary loading. I'll call this one v1 for the redundant loading. And what this tells me is that the displacement here in the primary loading plus the displacement here in the redundant loading better equal the displacement of the actual structure at B, which is zero. And so we know that the displacement at five meters is zero. And so we would say our compatibility equation would be by the principle of superposition, zero equals the displacement V zero at five meters plus the displacement for the redundant loading v1 at five meters yes this represents my actual structure this is that that primary loading or the displacement due to the primary loading and this is a displacement at that same location due to the redundant loading sometimes it's useful to put the subscript b here so you might see this okay and then depending on what you know in general the notation can get tricky here because sometimes depending on how you solve each of these individual statically determinate beam problems your coordinate systems might change depending on what the loading is and the method that you use it, it might get a little bit confusing and so what happens is that maybe it's better it's often expressed this way is to express the compatibility equation in terms of displacement like a generic symbol for like a magnitude and direction at a specific location. So for instance, this displacement at B at zero, we could just say has a deflection, capital delta B or displacement at B is equal to zero. And this would be the displacement, the magnitude of the displacement of B for the primary loading plus the magnitude of the displacement at B for the redundant loading. And this helps us simplify the expressions. That way, if we're not using equations of elastic curves. And this right here, this would be my compatibility equation. And in some cases, if you know the direction of the displacement, so for instance here, uh, let's say for in the primary loading, I know that this point B right here is going down. Okay, and that would be considered a negative displacement. And so some cases, some people will actually, they'll actually put that negative symbol in there so that all you have to do is deal with the magnitude value. Here, for here, it would be positive delta B1. And so now you're looking for just strictly magnitudes. We know that this is positive delta B1 because it's going above or up. It's it's your choice. I, I kind of prefer doing, using a relationship like this and letting my method for displacement determine whether or not the displacement is positive or negative. And that way I don't have to worry about knowing qualitatively what the deflective shape looks like. It's pretty easy for beams, but when you're dealing with slopes and then when you're dealing with frames, it can get a little bit challenging of figuring out what's negative or positive. But in any case, for, for deflections, it, it, it can be useful. Using this lower one with a negative sign in there can, can be useful as well. All right, so I have here my compatibility equation for the rest of this problem, this is the one that I am going to use. So now that I have a compatibility equation, if I look inside my compatibility equation, each symbol here is this, like delta B0 is its own little problem for calculating the deflection of this cantilever beam. And so the next thing I need to do is calculate these deflections here. And you've got like a kind of a choose your own adventure option here. And you can solve for these displacements the best way that you know how or the method that's most comfortable to you. I mean, you could be talking about the integration method, the conjugate beam method, method of virtual work, moment area methods, 
Castigliano's theorem. Shoot, you could even use the appendix of your textbook. That's a valid method because they've got all these like charts and tables and figures that have all the equations publicized. Whatever method suits you best or can help you solve for this would be the probably appropriate here unless someone specifies it 